Hello everybody out there in wrestling world, welcome back to another edition of your favorite wrestling podcast. This is Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson and I'm joined as always by my co-host, my partner in crime, the tag team man. He is Mr. Papa Smokes, the man with the angelic voice. How the hell are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great, Munson, and how are all my wrestling fans doing out there? We hope that everyone's doing well, keeping safe out there. Man, Papa Smokes, things are going crazy out there in the world today. COVID-19 cases are rising all the time, and it seems like we're in quarantine just about every week. Every once in a while, we get out of here, we get to have a little bit of fun, and then we're right back at home doing these uh, podcasts over the phone like we are here again today. Um we we'll hope everybody's staying safe and that we'll get back to some sort of normal, I'm guessing, at this rate, probably in 2021 right now. What do you think, Pop Smokes? Well, geez, I was one of those guys at the very beginning that uh, maybe a month or two and then this should have all blown over. So I was quite wrong in the first place. I'm not going to prognosticate anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, who knows? But uh, we're always hoping for the best. So, but anyway, speaking of good things, you're on Ring Respect Radio, and it's all good up in here. we got a great show listed for you today. So before we get started with that, we're going to ask you to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. And, you know, if you look closely, there's a tiny little bell beside the subscribe button. That's the notification bell. You click that thing, and you're going to get a notification anytime Papa Spokes and I drop new material right here on the Video Bros Network. We got a great show lined up. If you want to catch our show, you can also do so on Podbean and YouTube through our friends at Backbreaker Media. Uh, today we got a couple of great topics. But before we do that, Pop Smokes, we're talking about our friends over at Backbreaker Media. That's our friends over in Alberta. I just got to mention the Southern Alberta Invitational is now available on YouTube. The entire tournament has been put on YouTube for viewing pleasure. So. We're going to try to put a link down in the description below for you to go and check out our good friends in Alberta. Many faces that we know that were involved in that tournament, Papa Smokes. We're going to be doing a review coming up, hopefully on the next edition of Ring Respect. Are you looking forward to this one? Yeah, we did the uh, Northern Alberta Invitational last year. Had a great time watching and reviewing that. From all our buddies out there in Alberta, this year they've changed it up to the Southern Invitational. Let's watch this and review it too, Munson. Looking forward to it. And uh, speaking of reviews, tonight is all about reviews, Papa Smokes. We're going to be talking about our review of the documentary film, Nail in the Coffin, The Fall and Rise of Vampiro, which we were lucky enough to attend on behalf of our friends at the Saskatoon Film Festival, as well as, of course, our very own Prairie Pro Wrestling. We now uh, teamed up with those, the, those guys and also the Broadway Theatre in Saskatoon hosting the documentary and hey, Papa Smokes, we got to speak to the man himself, Vampiro, at the end of it all. So we're going to have some audio from the actual interview with myself and Vampiro, as well as the fans that were on hand at the actual film. We're going to get into a review of the actual film itself here as well, too. Talk a little bit about what we enjoyed of this one. And then, yes, it's exciting. MLW, the restart. It is finally here. We talked earlier in the year on Ring Respect about this coming up. It has finally happened. The episode has dropped on YouTube and on other platforms as well. So if you go and check out MLW, The Restart, we have got a full show review here for you tonight. Yes, Papa Smokes and I are going to start reviewing some good new wrestling for you. We've talked a lot about our love for stuff like MLW, for the independent scene, as well as NWA. And we're going to start including some of those reviews right here on Ring Respect for you. Speaking of NWA, news just dropped, Papa Smoke. NWA Shockwave is coming next week. This is going to be brand new for our friends at the National Wrestling Alliance. Our, uh, how are pumped are you to see the NWA making their return? Yeah, extremely pumped, Munson. You know, there were a lot of uh, times throughout this uh, pandemic and uh, COVID era that the company was looking pretty shaky. They were, they'd lost a lot of their roster members uh, that, I wasn't sure if they were ever going to come back. So this is fantastic news. And I imagine it'll be a bit of a flip-flop of all their talent, too, because, uh, like I say, they've lost lots of uh, their wrestlers to uh, other feds. And uh, I expect to see a bunch of new faces and all new action from the NWA. Certainly so. It's going to be an exciting time. I mean, as a wrestling fan, this is exciting in general that these companies are making a comeback. We're going to get to, you know, 
mix it up and maybe give the big boys a little bit of a uh, little bit of a nudge. Say, hey, you know what? There's some other up and comers coming through, and uh, they're doing stuff better than you guys. So watch out. But uh, let's uh, let's get on with the show here today, Papa Smokes. We're going to start with our experience for a nail in the coffin, the fall and rise of Vampiro. This is a documentary about, of course, wrestling icon Vampiro, uh, written and directed by, uh, I apologize if I don't pronounce this name right, and you know me, I'm terrible with names, uh, Michael Past, I, uh, P-A-S-Z-T, so please, anybody who can correct me on that, or uh, writer-director Michael Past himself, please reach out and tell Bobby how, how fucked up I got on your name there. I do apologize. But uh, yes, we got to attend this over at the Saskatoon Broadway Theatre uh, just recently, and uh, we were invited on behalf of uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling, who we are very much a part of, and also uh, the Saskatoon Film Festival, who those guys are right now actually putting that on as we speak, Papa Smokes. Uh, great job that they did in uh, putting this whole show together, and you know, it was wonderful to be, you know, invited out of the damn house to do something different for once. Uh, how did you feel about getting out and being able to do something? Yeah, that's just what I was going to say, too, is one of the best things about this evening was that uh, we could go and do something in public. We could do something related to Prairie Pro Wrestling, which has just, you know, left a hole in our lives since we haven't been able to do uh, live shows. So this was a little uh, cross-promotional venture in the with the movie world at the Broadway theater. And, uh, yeah, like you said, damn nice to get out of the house. So uh, we got to, uh, head down to that movie. They were very good about, uh, social distancing and stuff. I felt completely uh, comfortable there. Uh, I apparently haven't been to a movie at, at the Broadway in a long time because I realized they sold beer. Now that was quite a treat for us and uh, a great evening all around. Uh, but you want to get into the movie now, Munson? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you're right. They did serve beer. That was fantastic. And then beers at Amigos afterwards was also fantastic. Shout out to Amigos on the show here today. So the uh, the movie itself, The Rise and Fall of Vampiro, I did not know what to expect from this. In fact, I'll be the first to admit, I did not know that this documentary even existed up until the time that we were told that uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling was going to be uh, host co-hosting this event here. Uh, I will, I'll, I'll step out and say it out loud. I never was really a fan of Vampiro, the wrestler, from what I saw. And I mean, I'll admittedly say that with my knowledge of wrestling the way it was back in the 90s and stuff like that, I only really ever saw Vampiro, the WCW wrestler. Never really knew much of him prior to that with uh, Mexico or anything like that. I never knew much of him up until he became a commentator with Lucha Underground. So I did also didn't know about his career as a you know a director a producer behind the scenes as well too. So my hope going into this whole thing was that we would get to see more of the stuff I was not aware of and not focus so much on 1990s WCW Vampiro that I was aware of. And damn it, Papa Smokes, if we weren't treated to one hell of a documentary. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, uh, the way the movie opened with uh, showing him current day uh, working uh, as a production uh, uh, director in the back for uh, the TV show for Triple A Lucha. It was uh, quite intense watching him uh, do his job there and yell into the headset and stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm along with you too. I, I didn't really know much about Vampiro besides his name and what he looked like. I was thinking of doing a little bit of research before we went to this movie and then I kind of thought, ah, to hell with it, but I want to watch the story as they tell it and uh, discover about Vampiro as we go along and I'm kind of glad I did it that way because uh, it uh, tells his story quite well. It's not a, a biography or a documentary that goes in chronological order. They skip around from the, from the past to the present to the future kind of thing, but... Um, uh, yeah, I ended up learning a lot about him from his uh, kind of humble beginnings in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I, I never realized the guy was Canadian for one thing, and then uh, to, uh, he had had a friend who lived, who uh, worked and lived in uh, Los Angeles and worked in the uh, entertainment industry, and he ended up scoring that job as a uh, Roadie and bodyguard for Millie Vanilli. Didn't that just blow your mind, Munson? It really did. I mean, 
this was such a fascinating and well put together documentary. Like you said, I mean, you can easily get lost in doing that chronological order. And yet this one, it did that right balance of balancing between, you know, showing different aspects of his life and all throughout and really tying it together in a great way. And we will get into it in a bit. And like the second half of the the actual documentary focused less on his wrestling and more on his personal life as a father, which I actually find interesting as well, too. Yeah, yeah, and I think that was the ultimate. Uh, ultimately, the the main theme in the in this movie was that uh, he uh, uh, he did his stuff in the entertainment business and with uh, professional wrestling, but he really uh, everything he did was was for his daughter, and uh, it's really the story of a dad's love for his daughter, and uh, you know that that touches a lot of us. Uh, uh, Right where we feel, and uh, and it, it 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 garnered a sympathy for Vampiro, and uh, he got to understand man the way he feels and the way he thinks. Yes, yes, and you know, I mean, we're gonna go back to uh, let let's start off like you were saying at the beginning of this documentary, the stuff with AAA backstage showing him as a producer, and man, like, can this guy ever hold it together? Like it, watching this documentary, like. We've seen what it's like on a local basis, what uh, backstage is like, but I couldn't imagine being backstage at a triple mania and trying to bring all that together because that is one of the world's largest wrestling productions. And man, does he keep like, yeah, he's yelling at times, but all things considered, I find that the guy keeps a really cool head when it comes to putting the show together. Yeah, you got the feeling from uh, some of the people, uh, uh, the workers and, and staff and wrestlers backstage, uh, 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 all respect Vampiro. That, that's quite obvious because, uh, it shows a couple of his little speeches to the, to the, to the wrestlers and staff and, uh, and, uh, TV production people. And, uh, he's very well spoken. And, and, uh, I think everybody, uh, that works for him realizes that and respects him for that. And, uh, so that, yeah, I think if that's the case, you can get away with blowing up a little bit here and there as long as everything uh, comes back down to that even base. You know, and and a nice thing, too, like he shows this side of him where he's controlling certain situations that, you know, again, as a fan, it's easy to read what you hear on the Internet and stuff like that. We saw the the events there. I, I can't remember the two involved. It was sexy star and i can't remember the other uh woman's name i do uh, apologize Ro- rosemary it rosemary. rosemary there we go i there that's perfect thank you but yes that whole thing i mean everything you read at the time was just how awful a person sexy star was for that whole incident and this kind of shows it a little bit more in depth and how it was handled backstage and stuff and it doesn't make you focus on that you know, right away that she's a hundred percent just the worst human being on the planet. Like every news article would have had you believe when the event happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess uh, what had happened was there was some kind of uh, outside of the ring heat going on between the two lady competitors until uh, the match happened. And then uh, uh, sexy star went full shoot on Rosemary and, uh, with a with an arm bar and uh, damaged her arm pretty good. I can't remember if it was broken or not, but it, it was uh, injured quite severely. And uh, yeah, even uh, with the cameras there and everything, uh, uh, Vampiro's got the two wrestlers in the back uh, talking it out, and the three of them talk it out. And and uh, you know that that shows leadership that he's willing to uh, bring these these. Uh, combatants together and then to work something out diplomatically uh, backstage and, and even let the cameras from the documentary in there it's a, that, that that's a leader there and that, that's leadership skill well and then the way he handled jeff jarrett too jeff jarrett who just made a complete yeah. mess of things backstage at that show and man vampiro kept a cool head over that one and you, you really have to watch to experience but i mean Jeff Jarrett was really out of line from what you could tell, both from the documentary and what you've read. And Vampiro still to this day, I mean, Jeff Jarrett heavily featured in this documentary. I mean, he's still friends with the guy, still doesn't hold anything against him. But, you know, keeps guys under control that get out of control like that. It's good to see. Yeah, I think, uh, again, uh, Vampiro respects Jarrett for 
sort of breaking him into the business in the U.S. in the, in the WCW uh, era and such. And uh, so I think he was willing to cut him a little bit of slack. But, uh, man, what a madhouse it is backstage at those AAA shows. Uh, we saw a few incidents, including, uh, yeah, an obviously quite intoxicated Jeff Jarrett. Uh, he looked like he was trying to fight a parka. It looked like he was trying to fight a couple other guys. And uh, you got Killer Cross holding a chair in the background, thinking he might have to jump in and do something. And... Uh, Wow, a madhouse! Can you imagine having to uh, to uh, lord over that? Uh, we we have some backstage experiences uh, on our local level too, but uh, nothing quite like uh, in Mexico City there. Not at all, and yeah, and very impressive. I mean, and you know, outside of just being able to handle the talent themselves, uh, watching Vampiro sitting down with a headset, watching the different camera angles, and saying what camera should be where and who should be doing what, and pulling that all together, man. I was pumped to see stuff like that because that is the that is a portion that I really do enjoy having done the types of stuff I have done and everything. I find it very fascinating and seeing a guy do that, these guys who can sit there and direct cameras while watching something going on live and being able to, you know, almost like multitask these different ideas in their brain as well as relay it back to multiple people as the show's going live. I mean, it fucking impresses me, Pop Smokes. Yeah, yeah, and, and can you imagine what, what it would be like for uh, the video pros that over at PPW to have a, a director uh, directing us to it? It might make it a lot easier too. Uh, I, like we have our we have our knowledge down, I think, for, for the most part. But uh, imagine having a headset and a director yelling at you. You could get a real tight ship that way. I, I actually, uh, to be honest, I have done it before. Not that I've been in the director's chair, but I have been on camera for Shaw Cable in Saskatoon uh, during live sporting events and had somebody sitting there that's in a van and they're, you know, yelling out the different commands. And you got to be listening in to listen for your call. So, say, for example, your camera five, you're listening to everything the director's saying the whole time. And you got to make sure that not only are you paying attention, to your shot but if all of a sudden he goes camera five i need you to zoom out immediately you know and you're pull, you're going and doing your zoom out right away okay now i need to focus you focus you over to you know over to the left side of the field okay so you bring your camera to the left side of the field and then he's telling somebody in the truck to cue that camera up to be on on screen in like 10 seconds kind of thing it's a really fascinating experience and i almost think it takes a different type of talent altogether to be able to sit in that director's chair and be able to make all those calls, especially for a live sporting event. Well, yeah. And it's just interesting that uh, some performers and some people like we'll use wrestling as an example. Some of the performers are watching that stuff and listening as it goes on and learning it. And then just as Vampiro did, they, have a way to keep working in the business after their body gives out. And of course we saw that with Vampiro, he, he doesn't last too long with some of the matches he's doing. And uh, I mean, he's just, uh, he's one pile driver away from a wheelchair pretty much. And, uh, and uh, that, that's smart of him uh, uh, to keep his eyes and ears open. Uh, uh, we've talked about Jim Cornette before too. That's another guy that just, uh, kept his ears and eyes open, sat there and listened and watched at what the, uh, what the TV production people did, asked questions whenever he could with people that were friendly with him. And uh, and you can do that job, especially if you know the wrestling biz and the way matches work, and then you know some of the television production stuff too. Now all of a sudden you're a good asset for that company because you can take a position like that where you can direct others and uh, – get the best possible footage for your uh, matches. Well, and yeah, and I mean, you're 100% correct there, too. Like, I mean, when I uh, first got involved as well, too, I mean, I, that's kind of what I was told. Always keep your eyes and ears open or whatever, but uh, know when to keep your mouth shut at the same time. And maybe that third one I could take a little bit uh, more to heart sometimes and actually listen. But, uh, you know, I've always done that, Pop Smokes. I mean, you're right. Any of the guys that are willing to talk to you sit down and give you you know, information and knowledge, it's fantastic. And when I first started doing this kind of thing, obviously brought in through El Asesino and uh, also Dice Steel at the time, who were willing to teach me everything they possibly could. 
But then, you know, I started to get uh, chummy with guys like Mo Jabari backstage at Kid Chocolate from our HIW days. And guys like that would talk me through some things and start messaging me. And then, you know, uh, Michael Richard Blaze has been, you know, one I've always advocated for and always, uh, you know, talked great about because this guy, you know, you can mean, he didn't have to ever spend even a minute giving me the time of day, especially for my lack of time in the industry. And yet this guy not only would go over things with me, talk to me and, you know, go through different matches and stuff. He'd give me, you know, pointers and stuff. He'd always be open to talking, even if it was after a show, you know, through uh, messenger or through text or whatever. He's willing to talk me through things. I remember when we did the uh, the Halloween show um, for HIW Pop Smokes and there was that fans bring yeah. the weapons match. And I sat backstage having a discussion with Blaze about that match where it was uh, him and BVD versus uh, who do we have against uh, Flex Appeal with Mike McSugar and Michael Allen, Richard Clark. And it was Blaze that told me, you know, specifically, okay, you want to look for this specific cue in the match that I'm going to do or this guy's going to do. And right then at that given time, this guy is going to be behind you, but he's going to start rising up. And that's when you're going to want to turn around and capture that shot in particular because that's going to be the big like reveal surprise to finish the match off kind of thing. So, I mean, it was great. It's, it's awesome to learn from these guys. And even through PPW now, I mean, I got guys that sit down and have that discussion with me. I've, Jacob Creed does every single time. The, both of us, actually. Uh, Jacob Creed's fantastic for doing that, too. And, you know, some of the other boys are starting to catch on as well, too, and starting to get, like, we hear more from like Mitch Clark and Cheetah Bear Jude Dawkins as well too, and it's always great, especially as as video guys, to have guys that can share that knowledge with you there and help uh, you know get you into the right spot so that you can produce the way that you know it deserves to be to help them look good when it, the product's put out there. Yeah, the open communication between uh, wrestlers and the TV production guys or camera cameramen like we are. Uh, is just uh, it only it only contributes to making a better all around product which benefits all of us together, right? And and so those uh, wrestlers that uh, are open with their communication and their ideas towards uh, uh, the television production crew, such as you and I, it it just makes it so much easier. Such uh, turns out such a better product at the end, and uh, yeah, I love it. it. It's just fun certainly is so but yeah i mean that was i mean a good portion i'd say a third of that documentary and i mean that part was awesome uh the middle part i started talking a little bit more about his career but more about his breaking in and i mean it was interesting to see how he got the name uh again how did, how did they pronounce it Vamp- vampire canadianese or something and it was all yeah. the canadian vampire is basically what he was destined to be in Mexico and it was just a name that was given to him like you're gonna go out as this and they didn't really think much of it and this guy became a he became a damn rock star there in Mexico by the looks of it yeah absolutely it was kind of interesting to find out in the movie that he had been working in LA with Millie Vanilli and as a roadie and a bodyguard and such like that and then uh he got the tip to uh, go down to uh, Mexico City to be a wrestler, but he he had been a fan in his life, but he uh, he was also uh, untrained and untrained and with no idea for a character or anything like that. So, yeah, like you say, the, the promoters asked him well, what they, they liked this look because he had the uh, he had the long thin braids and the headband like, like which he got off of Millie Vanilli that was a cool look back then in the late 80s and uh, and he was handsome so they liked his look and they wanted to get him in there so I think they just kind of trained him on the fly and get, and asked him what he was into and he said punk rock and oh no, I like vampires too. Yeah. So said, well, you're, the, you're the Canadian vampire then and it's just funny how uh, casually some of the classic characters are born but uh that's the way they did it certainly was and i mean we're gonna spend probably the least amount of time on this part of it it was a it was an interesting way to find out about how he got started but i'm glad it only made up a short portion of the middle and then you know to my surprise the end of the film uh the big focus on his relationship with his daughter daisha and everything there i mean i maybe it's just i'm so used to seeing so many of these wrestling documentaries where it's 
you know, all about these guys who have fallen from grace and, you know, they've gotten to drugs and alcohol and that they've had to turn their life around and they've had to make up to the families that they abandoned and didn't see for years. And this is quite the opposite. Vampiro, I mean, what a what an interesting guy to begin with. And then his life as a father just it blew me away. I mean, this guy, everything he does for his daughter, like he's in that uh, in the one scene there where he's in that meeting with the people from AAA on the phone or whatever, and his daughter calls on his, his non-work phone, and he tells the people promoting AAA to hold on, he needs to talk to his daughter for a minute, and he takes that call immediately, and just to make sure that she's doing okay, and man, like, just mind-boggling how dedicated and committed he is to being a great father to his daughter there, and just excellent to see. I, I actually really enjoyed this part of the film. Yeah, yeah, and... uh he even has the quotation at some point in there that he said, he, I'm caught between wanting to see my daughter but needing to work for her. So he, here she is living up in, like, like she had lived with them in Mexico City, but I think him and his wife split when she, the child was very young. So once he got custody of her, he felt that a better place for her was up in Thunder Bay. So he took her up there and uh, presumably she was being helped being looked after by some of his relatives and uh yeah yeah as he said I, I, this is the only place i can work like i don't know how to do anything else i have to work down here and uh triple a is paying me good money to do this so yeah i want to see you but i have to take care of you too and you know such is the the dilemma of every parent that you want to spend every minute with your kid but you have to provide too and uh and uh, yeah, that's always the uh, the quandary, I guess. And, and he did it uh, as long as he could, and he made some money and made a comfortable place for her to live. And uh, I think he, by the sound of it, he's still down there working. But uh, she's a little bit older. Uh, we saw her graduate high school, so presumably she can come and live with him now, or or uh, you know at least see more of him now. Oh, you would think so, but it sounds like even she was uh, graduating with honors. So I imagine she's going off to big and better things at this point in time, already probably off uh, doing some uh, virtual college studies at this point. But, but uh, you know, it, it was overall, I mean, a great experience. I was happy, like, not only to go see a, uh, a film in a theater again, but, you know, it was just a great documentary, Pop Smokes. I've seen a lot of wrestling documentaries, and over and over again, there's so much negative that they focus on, and this one just kind of had a whole a whole different feel I found to it. And it took me from, you know, Vampiro bar barely being somebody that I even paid attention to at all to suddenly this dude ranks up there as a dude that I, I appreciate a lot now. And, uh, you know, nothing but the utmost respect for him after seeing this documentary. And I highly recommend it to anybody who has any involvement with wrestling, whether it's a fan or actually work in the industry. Yeah. And, uh, there was one thing, too, that, like you said, uh, lots of uh, documentaries go into the negative and, and end on a negative note. And this one actually did kind of end on a negative note because he had uh, maybe just uh, maybe just a little bit after the movie was filmed, it, it had an epilogue at the end that said that he had been uh, diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. And, and so it, it was sad at the end. But we were redeemed, though, Munson, because we got to speak to him right after we watched the movie, but also a year after that movie was made. And what a difference from what I was expecting uh, based on the sad ending of that movie. Yes, and that's a great way to segue into what's coming up here now, Papa Smokes. And you're going to find out a little bit more. Hopefully the audio is clear, but I'm going to try to do my best to transcribe this for the fans listening in and stuff like that but i've got uh audio recording on my phone here that i'm going to uh, present here on ring respect for you of us uh speaking to vampiro uh the way it was done this was done on a zoom cast in the actual broadway theater there uh vampiro was actually uh from i believe he's out in nevada right now he's getting treatment and like papa smoke said uh he had that early onset alzheimer's but you will find out in this audio clip that uh He's doing a hell of a lot better since the film was recorded, and you'll find out more uh, here shortly. Uh, so it was great. Uh, I just first want to say, even before we go into this audio right now, first of all, 
Thank you to Vampiro for him suggesting doing the Zoom questionnaire. I also want to thank uh, Jeff and John of the Saskatoon Film Festival. Jeff also one of the uh, great members of the Prairie Pro Wrestling team as well, too, who uh, personally invited uh, yours truly to be the one to actually relay the questions on behalf of everybody to Vampiro himself. So, I mean, it was uh, quite of honor to have somebody reach out and finally ask uh, me to participate in something like this, Pop Smokes. I was actually quite honored to get up there and uh, be able to take part in this. So, uh, yeah, yeah well, I mean, with, uh, with that being said, I think we should... Uh, Go straight to the audio here, and uh, we'll be back shortly. No, no, not at all. I think that um, 
I, I was very blessed to have uh, an upbringing uh, in Canada that gave me the intestinal fortitude. Sorry about that. You know, it's the green screen thing. Uh, and played hockey for a lot of years. That gave me the drive to quit, right? So I went to Mexico. I had a phenomenal career. Very lucky. But uh, I, I, I really want my, my, my daughter to understand how much I love her. Because I got divorced when she was like one years old. And I really didn't get a chance to be a dad. And I had this career and I was struggling with this mental health thing for my whole career, basically. And it was really hard for me to, to express myself in those kind of things. So when they approached me about the movie, I thought, maybe I won't be able to say it, but my daughter will see with why I wasn't at home or why I wasn't there. Or sometimes I couldn't answer questions or things like that. Maybe she can see what I, who her dad was. So I, I, I was excited to do the movie, but when I first saw it, it really depressed me. Because uh, I, I'm not that guy. And you can see now, that guy on the screen was a about 100 pounds heavier. I've lost 120 pounds since we've done the movie. The screen is my partner, Gregor. He's taking me on this journey, him and his wife, to get me better. And uh, I'm really working at it because I want to be a better person, a better version of myself, so I can be a better dad, and I can do Canada proud, and I can also make people like yourselves uh, proud of, of uh, the decision to support me. So, I, I didn't hesitate at all. It, it's it's uh, it's exciting as hell, man. I'm telling you, just to see those people sitting there in the audience with the world falling apart right now, watching my movie. Who gives a fuck about any of that? You know what I'm saying? The most important people in the world to me are the ones sitting in those seats right now. So you mentioned being from Canada, of course. You can tell us some of your best memories. What? What was your uh, best memories about, about uh, wrestling here in Canada? Wrestling who? Wrestling here in Canada. What were some of the best My memories? Favorite. I mean, Canada has this thing, you know, uh, Canadian sports fans are, look, I just saw the Lakers win the world, uh, the, the NBA thing, I just saw the Dodgers win the world uh, series, and, uh, there ain't nothing like Canadian fans, man. And I wrestle all over the world, but you know, Canada is just has that thing. So every time I'm to come to Canada, nobody really gives a shit about me. Nobody knew who I was, but I was so excited to be wrestling on my, 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 in my country for my people. You know what I'm saying? So it was always good to be that guy who left the small town, went out into the world, kind of made it, and then came back and didn't forget where he came from. So that, that was important for me. Awesome. Uh, you won the uh, WCW Tag Team titles with the Great Buddha here in Canada, Ron Connick in Vancouver. Uh, what was the decision to have you win all those titles? Are you guys watching that movie? Yeah, of course we are. That's my question, goddammit. Am I this big on the screen? Shoot. 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 Uh, what was the decision to have you win that night and only to draw from the very next evening? That was awesome. How do you think I felt? Uh, look, if I was a world champion for one day, for one minute, for a hundred years, I was still a world champion. And I did it beside my idol, my hero. So. I was extremely grateful and proud of that moment. Uh, the business really kind of sucked in the politics, and uh, I was really embarrassed when they took those belts away from us the next day. Not for me, I can do shit, but because of him, because of Muda, you know. To me, great Muda is, is a reason heavyweights uh, are accepted the way they do today, are today in wrestling. He was the first heavyweight who did all the high flying stuff moonsaulting and to die. It was always an acrobatic, crazy things and playing two characters at once, you know, painting his face and then wrestling as Muda or Mudo, depending on his mood. Uh, I, I, I just thought that he was the greatest thing ever in, in, 
to have him embarrassed like that on national television in the United States, it, it bothered me. It still bothers me, and I apologize to him every time I see him for that. He doesn't care, but, but I did. You know, it wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, how do you feel about uh, the influence that your ring work has had on the modern generation of professional wrestling? Brother, if I was there right now, can those people hear me? No. I would grab you by the neck and chill slam you through the stage. <laughs> and giving them the mic and let them ask questions. Who gives a shit about wrestling in WCW? And what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> what are you about now? How do you feel about uh, your, in, your the influence your ring work is had on the modern generation of professional wrestling? You mean all those guys that copy me and grow their hair long and then join bands and then become famous? Those guys are <laughs> very <laughs> uh, Is there absolutely anything in your career you do differently? Yeah. Look, man, if you're a professional wrestler and you really think that you are the most important thing, you're the influence, then, then, then you didn't learn any lessons. Like, I'm just grateful that the fans were able to see something in my character or in my ring work that, that inspired them. If there are young men and women in the business today that were inspired by my image or my work or my ethics or whatever, uh, I'm just another guy who's been blessed with being in the right place at the right time. There's nothing special about me. I did the work, I put the work in, I did the sacrifices. Uh, I believed in myself, and I had a lot of faith, and I committed to the mission. And uh, the things I learned from playing hockey didn't afford me to quit. So I've never had that, hey, look at me, and I'm the, I'm the first one, and I did this before you. Uh, that's wrong, because I didn't invent professional wrestling. I came into it 150 years after it was invented. Lifespan of a professional wrestler is eight or nine years at most if you make it. I've been fortunate enough to have a 38 year career so far. And uh, I think it's because of the fans, not because I've done something influential or there are people inspired by me. I believe it's the connection I have with the fan base that's allowed me to sustain this life and uh, continue on. If I've influenced other wrestlers, uh, I think that's my responsibility. Just like I was influenced, I must influence those and teach those who are coming after me so that they can do the same, so that the industry continues. I've never looked at it like, hey, I did that first and those guys are copying me. Uh, that's, that's That doesn't really mean much to me. Does that make sense? Fuck those guys. <laughs> Alright, uh, at this time I think uh, we're going to turn to the audience here and see if we have any uh, questions from anybody out there. Yes. Yeah, sure. Do you think WCW botched your angle with Sting? And do you have any creative influence on the angle? You can get a bit closer. No, I don't think they did. A lot, a lot of people say that now. Thank you for, for saying that. I know why you're saying it. I don't think they did. I think I was very blessed to even have that opportunity with Sting, with Ric Flair. Hogan, with being on national television, with being uh, uh, anything. I, 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 Can you repeat that? Who do you think won? Freddy or Jason? Freddy or Jason Voorhees? I, I don't know who these guys are. Jeff. Who do you think won? Freddy or Jason? If you have a question, someone can do your question for me. It's uh, who do you think won? Freddy or Jason? Oh, oh, and do that on purpose. Um, <laughs> I think the guys who wrote the movies and took the money at the door for seeing that shit movie. Yeah, basically. Anyone else? Uh, I just want to 
to say to Grant Farrell, thanks for uh, inspiring me to write about my own mental health issues and inspiring me to want to give professional wrestling a uh, uh, try. And I wore my uh, Juggalo jersey to represent the Juggalos here because I know you're close with them. I was just wondering if you have any road stories or anything that them. Um, I have no idea what the hell that question was. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, firstly, it was a comment first of all uh, that he respected what you have done. He wanted to uh, thank you for uh, <laughs> I don't know, how did I ever get uh, mental health issues as well? And then uh, as representing the general jersey today, I want to know if you had any road stories uh, revolving around your time with uh, general, the generals. Are there any people under 18 in this audience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but you can put it in its place, you know what I'm saying? And it's an everyday fight. You gotta be willing to go up that hill and push that rock up the hill. It just is what it is, you know what I mean? And if you have one good day and everybody expects you to, oh my God, he's better now, then the next day when you're a little bit depressed, people look at you. You have to be the one to be stronger than them and explain over and over and over. Because unless those people walk in your shoes, they don't know what it's like to have mental health issues. So so if you have anything that makes you feel a little bit different, consider yourself special because you've been giving something that they don't have and it makes your mind and your brain and your work and your heart commit deeper and stronger to the to the to the mission so that you can have a normal life. So that makes you a stronger person, a smarter person, a better person if you have mental health issues. Look at it like that, reframe shit. So for the person who said that, thank you. Um, what was the other part of the question? Something about what? Um, yeah, road, road stories? Yeah, road stories with the uh, generals. Yeah, you know what? I've got about 25 years of road stories. But here's something that I would rather meet with you. I can tell you stories and you can go to the bar right now and have a beer and even smoke a joint or whatever it is you're going to do and you're going to be like, that's a fucking cool story and that beer and this and did that. Google that shit. You can read about it and it's all true. But it doesn't matter. What's more important is today. Why do you want me to tell you about something I did 20 years ago when today, right now, when the world is completely fucked up and I'm sitting here watching you watch me and I'm blown away that you would take the time out of your day, out of your Friday night, Saturday night, and you would sit there and listen to me ramble on about anything. That is my reverse story. That's the fucking coolest moment ever. Fuck ICP and the juggles and all that shit. Shut up, juggles. Fuck ICP. You know, all that stuff, I love it. But what's more important is we're alive right now. A year ago, I was in a wheelchair. I should be dead right now. Who gives a shit about my own stories? I want to create tomorrow because I'm living today with you. That's more important. So don't get offended. I can tell you real stories that will make your eyes fall out, but it doesn't mean anything. What means everything to me is living this moment with you right now. Does that make sense? There you go. Thank you. Other questions? All right. All right. All right. How is the uh, how is your health right now, and what are you doing for treatment? Stop yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> if you had it coming. It was a sense of humor. Dude, my health is fucking rock star. Everything hurts. But it hurts so good, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm getting better. My mind is coming back. Uh, I feel great. I, I, my eating is on point. My weight, I'm, I'm 226 pounds instead of 340. I feel great. I feel great. I feel awesome. And uh, I'm blessed. So what else do you want? Plus, I'm in California and weed is legal, so life is fucking great, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you guys got, is, is marijuana legal up there in Saskatchewan? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Thank God. Is it? Yes. Yeah. See, 
you guys suck, man. Why didn't you invite me to this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe when you guys did that. I would have been there like, cat. I'm like, no. The organizers of that festival didn't think that was important enough. <laughs> We got any other questions? Would you do it all again? Yeah, one more. Uh, Would you do it all again? Good question. Yeah. Just one more. Twice as hard. Uh, are you still doing your occult stuff and uh, ghost stories and all that? So there's two questions there. One was, uh, would you do it all again? And the other one, second one was, uh, are you still doing the like, ghost stories and the occult uh, things? Like that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would do it all over again. And I would do it twice as hard. And I would hit that wall even harder. And I'd get up and I'd laugh at the wall. Then I'd hit it again. So, yes, I would. And uh, very much so. The paranormal stuff is a great hobby of mine. I love studying, I love learning. Part of the ascension process that I'm on, part of the reason I got better health is, of course, studying these things. The paranormal or whatever it is, or history, or ancient histories, and things like that are, are, are occultist themes. They're really not all they're made out to be mean. It's not really that dark. If you just do the homework and your research, you find out some pretty cool things about us. And uh, it's, it's astounding how much they've tried to keep hidden from me and you. So I like to really do my research about these obscure details and I get into it. And it but, uh, it's something I personally really enjoy doing. So yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Are you still living in your morgue and playing video games? And if so, what's your favorite video game? Am I still what? So are you uh, are you still living in your morgue and are you still playing video games? And I'll just say what's your favorite video game? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still living in my morgue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I play video games like crazy, man. As a matter of fact, I got my my my, my special medicine for and uh, I'm going to play the new Call of Duty. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect. I think that's all the questions that we've got from the audience here tonight. Uh, I, on behalf of all of us here, I want to thank you very much and for taking the time out to uh, talk to us, answer questions, and also for allowing us to uh, view the documentary tonight. We had an awesome time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, the honor is all honors. Thank you very much. There you have it, everybody. That was the audio from our night uh, talking to Vampiro after the uh, Nail in the Coffin uh, documentary. Jack out the Nail in the Coffin documentary. And hey, Papa Smokes, I know that uh, it might not have exactly been my question, but I was relaying the one there regarding WCW to Vampiro. And Vampiro, I know if by chance you happen to be listening, brother, I know you mentioned about coming down and choke slamming my ass for asking the question. And even though it might not have been my actual question, I'm actually going to extend the personal invite right now that once all this COVID shit is gone and done with and PPW gets to open their damn doors back up, you know what? We've got a ring. I've got cameras. 
Let's head in there and let's have Vampiro choke slam Bobby Munson right in the middle of a PPW ring. And afterwards, I'll roll up that joint we spoke so highly about. We're going to go out there and me, you, and Papa Smokes are going to spoke the night away just like three brothers should. <laughs> Sounds like a good time, Munson. I hope he gets that invite. I sure hope he does. I'm going to reach out to him on social media here and uh, hopefully he decides to uh, check check this out and takes me up on the invite here as well too. But uh, that's going to wrap it up for the Vampiro Talk. So we got some more reviewing to do here, Papa Smokes, because we got some new wrestling to go through. MLW, the restart is back and we both were happy to check this out on YouTube. Uh, by the time this recording comes out, the uh, second episode will have been up and running by then as well too. So that review will be coming shortly after. Uh, but let's uh, start with MLW, the hashtag, the restart. And let's give people a little bit of a uh, an open to the story here, Pop Smokes. Give them a insight. The idea is that while they were away for all this time, is that the, the faction Contra had taken over the MLW headquarters. And that's why MLW had not been operating over the last several months. If that's the storyline that you got from that as well too? Yeah, yeah. You can see that they were uh, constantly uh, trying to take over the airwaves on, on episodes of Fusion uh, before COVID hit. And every so often they would uh, interrupt a match or uh, somebody's promo with their uh, with their propaganda over the air there. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's looking like they uh, they shut down the MLW network and uh and uh, MLW has just finally regained control of the network and can uh, continue with their show. And you can actually catch that at the beginning of the show as well, too. You'll see the whole thing where the uh, crew actually uh, decide to head on in and uh, spearhead taking Contra out and regaining back uh, control of MLW headquarters and allowing us to once again have MLW Fusion. So what a, uh, what a great way to uh, kick off... MLW the restart man uh first thing they do is they got a national open weight championship match for us we're gonna get to see Alexander Hammerstone after how many months and he's up against uh the uh, guy's name was Duggan if I'm not mistaken and this one could not a very long match by any any means yeah yeah well well first of all Munson I wanted to uh just talk about the uh, the way this looked, uh, the way it appeared. They're obviously not taping at the regular place, which is the Melrose Ballroom in Queens, New York. Um, I always like that venue because it has the balcony and it, it's it's got the room for the right number of fans for a, a TV taping. Uh, lots to make it loud, but but not too many, right? And when I watched uh, Hammerstone walk out for this match, yeah, I I have to admit, months in the end. I was a little taken aback. I mean, this this wasn't taped in the Melrose Ballroom. This was obviously a bar of some kind, right? It was a, I would venture a strip club or a nightclub. They had the uh, the uh, dance floor with the uh, the wood flooring and everything, and uh, and the uh, handrails and such. And uh, I was kind of taken aback by that, thinking that maybe MLW would have a better uh, venue than that. But anyway, this is where they did their taping, and uh, no fans, just uh, TV production crew and wrestlers and referees. So that's the way it looked, and that's the way it came out. We have uh, our announcers were Rich Bikini and a new guy, Jared St. Laurent. I'm not familiar with this guy, but... Uh, they uh, led into a couple of packages, announcements of matches for, for uh, the restart show. Uh, they uh, also um, uh, basically just set the table for what this uh, uh, show was going to be and, and provided a little bit of recent history from MLW showing some of the, uh, the World Heavyweight Championship uh, wins and uh, tag team matches and also... Uh, Opera Cup 2019 highlights, which we're going to get to a little bit later, the Opera Cup 2020. But anyway, yes, now we had this match, uh, Hammerstone versus Jason Dugan. Now, what did you think of this match, Munson? Uh, what a great way to kick off show. I mean, is, is, there's not much to say. I mean, this is 20 seconds, a nightmare pendulum from Hammerstone and the damn thing's over. But it's exactly what you needed to kick this thing into high gear, in my opinion. And what Alexander Hammerstone needed 
to get things started as well, too. A reason to be in the ring and a reason to come out and cut his promo that he does right after the match as well, too. Yeah, and it made Hammerstone look extremely, extremely powerful, which he is. He, he's one of these rare wrestlers that seems to have gained momentum while not even performing very much throughout COVID. So I think it's a good way to debut him uh, on the restart. Uh, he's got that open weight championship, but uh, this uh, opponent of his, uh, Jason Dugan, was, was no match whatsoever. Uh, he did the nightmare pendulum hard, and uh, that was one since Hammer grabbed the mic, called out. Uh, Jacob Fatu and Contra, and uh, this has been a match that uh, the fans have been salivating for all this time since the shutdown was uh, Jacob Fatu title match versus uh, Alexander Hammerstone, and uh, yeah, the fans want to see this match, and, and now it looks like we might be in the very opening stages of uh, setting it up. I'm just glad... They didn't just give it away. I mean, so many times wrestling companies, it's like, well, that's what everybody wants according to what we see on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. So let's just give it to them immediately. And MLW is like, no, nah, pump the damn brakes. Let's uh, let's build this thing and make it worth our while kind of thing. This is our cash cow and we're going to milk it. Absolutely. That, that's how it's done in wrestling. And uh, you put your big matches like that on uh, pay-per-view so that the fans pay for them and... Uh... And this is exactly one of those. Uh, they're not going to put that one on YouTube for free. That's okay. Tell me where to pay the money and they can take my damn money. I, w- I will pay for that match gladly, happily. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one too. I really hope it happens in the upcoming future. And, uh, good God, uh, we'll just see what happens with uh, that belt because uh, uh, Jacob Fatu's had a stranglehold on the heavyweight championship for over a year now. Yeah, and well, I mean... And then Alexander Hammerstone has had that uh, National Openweight Championship even longer. He is now officially the longest reigning uh, champion of any kind in MLW's history. Yeah, yeah. And I think he might be the first Openweight champion uh, to have that belt, too. So, uh, yeah, he's got a stranglehold on that one, too. Yeah, just making that belt look stronger as well. So, yeah, that we're going to get more into Hammerstone and Jacob Fatu, obviously, because there's more that unfolds throughout this show. But uh, we'll move ahead a little bit here as well. Uh, a few things that you brought up. And before I even mention about the next match that we're going to get into, uh, you mentioned about the look. And one thing I do have to say, I know you were taken back and... I understand that completely because when they walked out, I kind of got that. And then, I mean, it sunk in right away. I mean, you're not going to necessarily pay top dollar for an arena or something like that that you normally could fill fans with. You're going to have to scale it back some. What I did like is this looked and felt like a sporting event to me once they got inside that ring. The way the names were presented on the screen, the way the announcers talked about them, the way the wrestling was presented in general, this felt like... What everybody was hoping AEW was supposed to feel like, and were left disappointed. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I love the sports-oriented uh, uh, take that they have on it, uh, giving the tale of the tape at the beginning, the height and weight and such of each uh, wrestler, and uh, they always have uh, the kind of like a sports game, the the video at the top, like a little ticker almost of the wrestlers' names, and then the time clock too. So it's it's presented like a like a real sporting event, and I, I, I think that only helps uh, their cause completely. And uh, I, I also, uh, I was making fun of their venue a little bit, but I, as it went on and I watched it, it had the look of, uh, of a good indie show. Like it, it, uh, it had the look of, you might be sitting there in the crowd watching this right now because it's a bit quieter and all that. And uh, I, I definitely got uh, absorbed in it after a while. So uh, uh, not a big deal about their venue. I just uh, I was surprised at first. Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess it's also, too, like everything we've seen from wrestling in this last year has all been the big guys, and they keep doing these big arena shows with nobody in them. So you're used to seeing those empty crowds and stuff. And this one... Like you said, my, like once you got into it, it had that indie feel to it and everything, as if the cameras were filmed on the same side as where the audience was sitting. So you just kind of, you started to feel like you were a part of it, as opposed to it just being one big empty arena in the end. Yeah, yeah, I liked that a lot. So after that, uh, 
we had a package of on the middleweight champ Myron Reed from the uh, faction Injustice. He said uh, his issues with Pillman uh, in the months leading up to the shutdown of COVID earlier this year. So we're going to have a match upcoming. Uh, now we started uh, with a package on middleweight champ Byron Reed from the faction Injustice. He's had his issues with uh, Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, in the months leading up to the uh, COVID shutdown earlier this year. So we're going to have that match coming up, Myron Reed versus Brian Pillman Jr. for the middleweight championship. First, we had a commercial for Stephen P. New Law Offices. I kind of had to chuckle. Stephen's <laughs> got his finger in a number of pies around the wrestling world these days. It cracked me up to see that. Oh, wait, are you talking about Stephen B. New, Stephen B. New, Stephen B. New, Stephen B. New? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the guy. Uh, I, I chuckled just as much as you did, Papa Smokes. It's written right in my notes here. Stephen B. New Law Offices. Right there. So, I mean, he's getting a free shout out on Ring Respect here today, just out of respect for everything I've heard about the guy. And now I get to put a face to the name. Yeah, yeah. Next up, we have the match Myron Reed versus Brian Pillman Jr. What did you think of this match, Munson? Well, you know, going into this one, uh, I was, you know, pumped to get a, uh, a middleweight championship match. I expected that we were going to get quite a solid match. And we got a decent match. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go out and say this was the strongest piece on the entire show. Um, there's obviously a few times where you could tell that these guys are still kind of green. Especially, you know, I find Myron Reed still a little bit green at times and stuff like that. But a lot of so much potential in both of them that it kind of it. You can almost balance it out and forgive for it because you know you're watching two guys that you're gonna see do so much more in their career moving forward as well too. Yeah, I think that's a good way to work it. I liked this match, but uh, it lacked a little hot sauce for me somehow. Uh, uh, I I actually thought Reed did better in the match than Pillman. I, I've seen some of Pillman's other matches. He, he you're right. He, he still has that green to him for sure. But uh, I look his look, and I, I think he's good all around. But yeah, this this just wasn't uh, a great match for either of these guys. They got uh, 10 minutes or so, so they a uh, decent length for a TV match. Uh, Reed won clean with his finisher, the Captain Crunch, kind of a muscle buster type move. And uh, so a clean win, even though he had his people make Jordan Oliver outside the ring, looked like he was interfere a couple times, but did not. And uh, yeah, a clean pinfall win for Mike. Reed, and then uh, he grabbed the mic and called out to Leo Rush, who was apparently uh, uh, incoming to MLW after his uh, NXT experience of recent uh, recent times. What do you think about this? I, I was surprised. I mean, yeah, you know, he spent time with NXT. He was also up on the main roster there for quite a while. So, I mean, this is in many ways quite a name. I know that you know, I we've obviously heard stories about what Leo Rush is like sometimes backstage and a couple of the spots that he's done as a young guy and, you know, under really undersold what he's doing, which that part of him frustrates me a little bit as a wrestling fan. But again, he is young. Obviously, guys do some stupid things at times. And there's there's a lot of redeeming qualities about what Leo Rush is capable of. And I'm sure that he did gain a lot of experience with his time over in WWE both in terms of his mic work being a manager to Bobby Lashley, as well as the in-ring stuff that he was doing between there and NXT as well, too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, he may have been in MLW before he got called up to WWE. So maybe this is like a homecoming. Don't quote me on that, but I think he might have been under a different name. But at any rate, uh, yeah, it does good for MLW to have a name that people recognize come in and... Uh, this is looking like a, it could be a good uh, angle for uh, Myron Reed and, and Injustice to, uh, to battle against Leo Ruff. I think their styles are going to fit together a lot more, too. Uh, you, we talked about uh, with Pillman Jr. and stuff like that. I think the styles were just too much of a clash. It seemed like, I guess the fair way to put it, it seemed like two different guys, two different styles, both trying to work their own style. Neither one works because neither one fits together. 
Okay, that's one way to put it for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we're going to get so much more with Leo Rush and Myron Reed inside the ring. I just, I honestly think that there's just going to be a lot better, uh, you know, in terms of like the the style the two do inside the ring, I think is going to work a lot better with those two than it did with Brian Pillman Jr. Again, yeah, I, I think I'm with you on Pillman Jr. Though, just uh, you could really tell where he's green still. I uh, you you know that there's a lot more to come from him, but he's had better. Myron Reed, I mean, I'm I'm sold on him. I like him. I don't know about uh, Jordan Oliver on the outside there. I, if I'm supposed to think that he's the most annoying guy on the planet, then mission accomplished because that guy annoys the shit out of me anytime he's on the screen. <laughs> yeah, I, it might be partly uh, purposeful, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I like this uh, faction injustice. The other guy is Kodo Brazil. We haven't seen him around recently, but... Uh, uh, I'm sure once uh, you know some the traveling gets done, uh, uh, like a, for this restart, you could see that that not every not all hands were on deck to uh, you know make appearances in this. They wanted to tape some matches and get it out. So uh, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, more of injustice and uh, and more of, of the whole roster uh, in coming weeks. Yeah, it should be very very interesting. So. Um, I guess uh, up next would be, was it the 2020 Opera Cup brackets announced was the next thing on there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, had a, little, they had a couple of little packages telling you some more history from recent history from MLW and some of the angles they run. But then they did a package on the history of the Opera Cup um, from the turn of the century. Uh it was fought for 50 years uh, uh, since the beginning of 1900. Uh, the, it was called that because the, a lot of the matches were held in opera houses up in the up in New England area, New York and Boston. And uh, yeah, 1948 was its last year, and Stu Hart won the trophy and ended up keeping it because the tournament didn't go on after that. And uh, as we heard from last year, uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. had been up at the Hart Mansion in Calgary, r- uh, rummaging and rooting through some old uh, family stuff, and uh, found amongst Stu's stuff the actual trophy for the Opera Cup, and uh, kind of figured out what it was, brought it down to his boss, uh, Cork Bauer at MLW, and said, hey man, do you think we could do something with this cool statue that Stu won in the past, and... and like the uh, intelligent businessman that he is, Bauer said, hell, let's start the Opera Cup entire tournament again, and we'll use that trophy as the as the prize. And I just think it's a great idea. You know, a, a retro wrestling historian like myself is just going to love a, a, an artifact from the past being brought like that and being given new life. And I just love what they're doing with the Opera Cup, and uh, cheers to uh, Davy Boy and, and Court for getting that going. Uh, what a great idea! Well, and then uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. being the one that won it in twenty nineteen as well, too. So, mad props to him not only for getting it going, but being able to you know etch his name into the legacy of the Opera Cup, and you know maybe going to get an opportunity to do it twice because his name, one of the ones that is on the twenty twenty Opera Cup, we'll get to in a moment here. Uh, but that's uh, yeah. Let's maybe run through some of these matches and talk a little bit about it. Uh, first one we're going to see in that 2020 Opera Cup: uh, Tom Lawler versus Rocky Romero. Papa Smokes. Yeah, I, I don't know a whole lot about Rocky Romero. I think he might be one of their uh, Mexican talents from uh, AAA. Uh, should be interesting. But uh, filthy Tom Lawler. I mean, we could. Uh, has a rich, rich history of, in MLW, a former world heavyweight champion, former MMA and uh, UFC fighter, and uh, he's he's gone the gambit from uh, fan favorite to uh, despised villain kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's got to be one of the front runners to win it this year. Certainly so. And then you mentioned him being a former MLW heavyweight champion, but former MLW heavyweight champion Low Key also involved in the tournament as he takes on last year's Opera Cup winner, Davey Boy Smith Jr. Yeah, this has uh, all the trappings to be a huge first round match. Uh, 
we all know about uh, Davy Boy Smith Jr. He's he's a shoot fighter. He's learning all kinds of you know, grappling. He uh, he trains in Japan. He trains in Germany. He trains all around the states and Canada with various uh, uh, masters of uh, martial arts and uh, catches catch can grappling. And uh, he's always ready to go six six two hundred and fifty pounds or whatever. And then. Yeah, you know, so Loki. Everybody remembers Loki from uh, some of his infamous incidents of the past. This guy's also one of those wrestlers that rides the line between shoot fighter and professional wrestler kind of thing, and uh, he's got some uh, stains on uh, his reputation for some of the rough stuff he's been involved in uh, in the ring and. Uh, 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 unpredictable and, and very difficult opponent to, that that might be the the first round match to watch right there for sure uh next one up uh i don't know a lot about the laredo kid but laredo kid taking on ach i'm a little more, more familiar with ach than i'd say i am with laredo uh, but very interesting uh, match up there as well too yeah laredo kid is for sure a, a triple a lucha wrestler and uh he came to some small prominence last year anyway over his match against Alexander Hammerstone. And uh, watch that one if you get the chance. Uh, uh, Hammerstone and the Laredo kid put on a, a, an instant classic, and uh, that's a real good one. That's the only of his matches I've seen. So I'm interested to see more. Same with ACH. I've watched some, but... Uh, I'm not uh, intimate with this style, so I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about him. Yeah, see, I saw more of ACH in uh, Ring of Honor, and uh, I, I like yeah. his, like what he can do. I mean, he's very capable, so I think uh, after you saying that Laredo Kid, you know, put on an instant classic with a guy like Alexander Hammerstone, you know, my excitement level for Laredo Kid and ACH just went up uh, at least a few more notches already there. Yeah, Laredo Kid's a bumping machine, and uh, we've all seen how big ACH is. We might see some good stuff in that match. Awesome. And then the last match in the tournament, Richard Holiday and TJP going to go one-on-one. Yeah, that should be interesting. I, I'm, I'm kind of looking for Holiday to uh, either get pushed or, uh, or start to sink off the card a little bit. I like this guy, though. I think he's good. He's part of the uh, dynasty faction with uh, Hammerstone and, and formerly, of course, uh, Maxwell Friedman. And, uh, yeah, I think Holiday is, is a funny guy. He's good on the mic. He's, he's big. He's got a good build and look to him. Uh, I think he just he needs the opportunity to have a couple of classic matches, and uh, maybe the Opera Cup's going to be his time to shine, but he's got TJ Perkins in the first match, and you know, the, the little speedster and uh, aerial artist like that, it, it won't be easy. Well, and a lot of spe- experience for TJP. I mean, this guy goes back to, uh, you know, Impact Wrestling and before that even, and then had a good run with WWE, both the, uh, not only as the winner of the uh, Cruiserweight Classic, but their first uh, reintroduction to the Cruiserweights, the first Cruiserweight champion that they had going forth with the new Cruiserweight division over in modern day WWE, so... I mean, he brings a name, he brings that speed, and he brings experience. It should make for an interesting time. But, yeah, Richard Holiday, it'd be interesting to see. They can have him go over TJP. Who knows where this guy could go in this Opera Cup. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm already excited about the, uh, the brackets being released. And, uh, look, we got four hot matches to start this, and then a couple more after that. Have a new Opera Cup winner. I'm totally excited to see who it's going to be this year. All I can say is, if they have lockdown this Christmas season, I'm going to have no shortage of things to watch, and that's okay by Bobby Munson because I could watch some good old wrestling over the holidays. That's for sure. Absolutely. So, uh, last but not least, I believe uh, we're heading to the main event now, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, they, they had a, again a couple more promos, a couple more little packages. This is stuff for any fans catching them up, but uh, introducing them to some characters such as the Von Ericks and uh, Richard Holiday and uh, a couple little packages, but yeah, now it's main event time, and uh, we got champion, MLW heavyweight champion Jacob Fatu versus Baby Boy Smith Jr. Now, this is a pretty big match, too, and uh, we talked about uh, 
free matches on YouTube, but uh, this this one will bring the fans in and get them hooked. And so it should. I mean, we're talking about two fantastic guys. And anyone listening right now who's not familiar, I know most who listen to our show probably a little more familiar with Davey Boy Smith Jr. being that he's from Calgary. You know, he's worked these areas and stuff like that before. But if you do not know of Jacob Fatu, you are doing yourself a total Myron Reed injustice by not checking this guy out. Because Jacob Fatu is the Samoan that is needed in wrestling right now. I mean, we, we, we've seen what they're doing with the Usos, with Roman Reigns over on the dub. That's great. But Jacob Fatu completely, in my opinion, makes that look like child's play when this guy gets on a microphone and steps inside of a ring. Yeah, I, I think so too. It still kind of uh, boggles my mind that this guy isn't in a, a bigger company than MLW. Uh, but uh, as we've discussed before on the, on the podcast, I think the workers like working at MLW and, and when they're offered contracts are, are uh, enjoy taking because they get a certain amount of uh, freedom and, and, and whatever whatever other perks they get with it. But uh, Jacob Fatu is like a he's uh, he's like a combination of uh, Jey Uso and Maga kind of because he's uh, he's huge and strong and a bulldozer type type wrestler. But he's also got the he's so agile and so light on his feet and he does some aerial maneuvers to perfection. So, I mean, he's everything that you could want in a wrestler, uh, especially in the, the new uh, modern wrestling world where everybody's so constantly doing aerial spots. Well, this big 300 pounder can do them just as good as anybody. And uh, as we saw in this match against Davey Boy Smith, he, he held nothing back. And, and talk about like when this guy gets on a microphone, I believe what he's telling me. I don't feel like this guy's reading some script that he's been handed and told to say this or some goofy thing that he's supposed to record or something like this. This guy sounds like a dude who is a champion who w- wants to take on the best guys in the business and who doesn't he doesn't care who he pushes around and steps over in the process of doing it. He wants to fight and he wants to, you know, kick the shit out of guys and he's going to let you know that he wants to kick the shit out of guys and I think that's that's what gets me excited about watching Jacob Fought too is he not only delivers in the ring, he lets you hear it on a microphone as well, too, and you go, God damn, I want to see this guy in the ring again right away. Yeah, his promo style very much mirrors his in-ring style. It's just very tough, very brutal, very upfront, and uh, he talks like a, a mean uh, rapper or something like that, and he's just got the, got that tone in his voice and that sneer on his face, and Nothing fancy. He just uh, he tells you what he wants, and like you said, what he wants is a fight and some competition. And uh, I, I just think the guy is awesome, and uh, I can see why they have the uh, heavyweight title around his weight because it's a guy that can handle it. Yeah, and the match itself, fantastic. Like, here's the one thing I find like I really like about not only this match but MLW in general is you've got a guy the level of Davy Boy Smith Jr. You put him in against your champion Jacob Fatu. And so many modern fans, they want these belts bounce back and forth between every single guy. Everybody needs a time with the belt. This guy for two weeks. This guy for two weeks so that everyone can be a damn champion. But that is not what we're getting in MLW. You, get, David Boy Smith Jr. gets in there. He puts on a hell of a match here with Jacob Fatu. The two of them go back and forth. And in the end, yeah, Jacob Fatu wins this match, looks strong, remains strong as a champion. But Davey didn't look like a chump in the process. And even though this wasn't one of those 30 minute, you know, kick out of every finisher, 17 false finishes, you know, back and forth bullshit, both guys looked strong in it, but Jacob Fatu, the champion who is supposed to look strong, looked even stronger coming out of it. Yeah. Right. And and they had, uh, I think that match was 11 minutes or 12 minutes, something like that, which is, uh, which is even kind of long for a typical uh, a TV match. Well, of course, not nowadays. Nowadays, they have 20-minute matches on TV, which I just, again, I don't see the point of that. That's much, much longer than what you need and much longer than what uh, most fans' uh, attention span will even last for. But, uh, yeah, this this 11- or 12-minute match had everything in it. It had... Uh, a 
nice uh, uh, feeling out process at the beginning. Some some strong uh, collar and elbow hookups where they were straining against each other. I mean, it looked like a real fight. It looked like a real competition. And uh, they had a few uh, chop wars and they had a headbutt war, which uh, never seems like a good idea against one of those Samoans. But uh, Smith hung in there for that too. And then uh, finally took the loss on with the uh, Samoan drop and then the patented uh, springing up in the corner moonsault that Fatu does, which is just amazing to see a man of that size uh, look so graceful and, and hit that hit that moonsault splash like that. And uh, Davy Boy Smith done. It was it was one two three, but absolutely no shame in losing to the champ uh, clean like that. No, exactly. And again, like. You, you talk about that finishing move, that moonsault. I mean, it's a remarkable move. I've seen guys half his size not capable of doing it so cleanly and perfectly as what Jacob Fatu performs that move at. Yeah, yeah. He's just, he's really quite an exceptional talent. He's quite young. And, uh, yeah, I, I just really, really hope that he stays in MLW and a show that I enjoy, that I like to watch instead of maybe going to some other promotion and, taking the chance of being misused or uh, having some of his uh, fierce aura taken away by losing some matches on TV. Or I don't know. I, I watch some of these current shows and I'm just baffled by how they, they misuse and mishandle uh, what look to be awesome upcoming stars. And I just don't want to see that happen to some of my favorites. So I, I, selfishly, I'm just glad if they stay in MLW. Exactly. And, you know, that way we can have uh, great contact to keep reviewing here on the show as well, too. But uh, before we even wrap up the MLW, I mean, that's not where it all ends. Jacob Fatu wins this match and right away he's on that microphone and he's dropping one of those promos we talk about. He's calling out Alexander Hammerstone this time. Uh, the uh, the war is on between these two guys, Pop Smokes. Yeah, Fatu grabs the mic and says, what about Hammerstone? Get your bitch ass out here. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the way he talks. It's convincing. It's straight up. It, it, it's compelling. So, yeah, yeah. and uh, a man like Alexander Hammerstone also isn't going to take that sitting down. So he was out there in a second uh, to confront uh, Jacob Fatu, and and then uh, we all saw what happened after that. Yeah, then uh, it lured right into the trap, and the uh, attack from behind. Uh, Hammerstone laid out flat, and. The, Champion uh, goes off looking even stronger, and again, sympathy for the babyface in that sense, which is great. That's what you want to do. Like Hammerstone's been running his mouth; he wants the match. Well, guess what? You know what? You're you just drew yourself into a feud with one of the toughest uh, guys and toughest factions in professional wrestling today, and you just got caught into their trap. You got your ass handed to you. You better toughen up because uh, war's on now. Yeah, yeah, that's just it. You, you... You're never just challenging Jacob Fatu. He's a he's the card carrying member of Contra, and you know that those other members of Contra aren't going to take that uh, at all. And uh, Joseph Samael, the, the kind of maniacal leader of, of Contra, promised that uh, in an earlier package on this show that he was working on his evil plans, and he's always looking to uh, dominate uh, the entire. Uh, industry and starting with MLW and uh, yeah, anyone that steps in Contra's face is uh, you're not just fighting one of them, you're going to be fighting them all. And this person that attacked uh, Hammerstone after the match was uh, yet another new guy. They were calling the, him the Black Hand of Contra. And he had kind of a black leather mask and a black glove on. Him. Was was a huge, huge guy. I don't know who that is, but uh, I suppose we'll be seeing more of him. So now it's looking like Contra even has another member, and uh, they're just a devastating faction. And uh, if you get them on your ass in MLW, you're, you're in for a world of hurt. Yeah, and you know what? You mentioned about not knowing who that was. I, I was the same boat. I didn't know who it was either. I didn't bother to go look into it because I, in some way I don't want to know the mystique of the character right now was so awesome. Like, I'm watching that whole bit. It was like, here's a guy we've never seen. Holy shit, he's bigger than Hammerstone and Fat too. And he comes out and just lays Hammerstone out. Oh, my God. What's Hammerstone got himself into? This is exciting. It leaves it on a cliffhanger. and makes me go, I don't want to wait a whole other week for another episode of MLW Fusion. 
I enjoyed myself, Papa Smokes. I had a hell of a time watching this show. Yeah, myself also. I'm just so glad it's back on again. Uh, I've been uh, having a lot of fun going into the uh, archives of the past, as I always do. But, you know, we all need some new uh, new material coming out and some new matches. I like to keep up with what's going on in wrestling today. And uh, I'm not much of a WWE guy, so uh, I-, I like to watch something else that's a little more grassroots style. And MLW scratches that itch for me. And I, I can't, I'm so glad they're back and I can't wait to watch more. Yes. And, uh, you know, with that said, that'll wrap up our review of MLW Fusion for this week and MLW The Restart. Uh, I think we're going to carry on with more of those moving forward. We're going to start including some ML, uh, sorry, some NWA reviews in there as well, too, moving forward, because we're both big fans there. And, you know, like we said earlier, the Southern Alberta Invitational Tournament. But if any of you out there that are listening to Ring Respect right now know of any independent promotions that have regular shows or have had events within recent time that are you know definitely worth a look you want to reach out to pop smokes and i in the comments or on social media as well too let us know about these events if it's something that pop smokes and i truly enjoy that we can you know find the uh you know the great parts of and stuff like that and have a great discussion on the podcast we would love to do more reviews of some independent companies as well too so you know drop us a line let us know what's going on out there in uh, wrestling world but before we wrap up the show entirely, Pop Smokes, anything else you'd like to add here on the show today? No, no, just uh, everybody uh, stay in and be safe and uh, watch your wrestling and uh, listen to Video Bros Network. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks again, Papa Smokes, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Remember to hit like and subscribe, and also check us out on Backbreaker Media, YouTube, and Podbean as well, too, where you can catch every episode of Ring Respect. And that's, once again... Another show in the bag from us here at the Video Bros Network. Bobby Monson, Papa Smoke saying have a good night and we'll see you soon.